which smartphone is currently the best for shooting video. I've looked at all the major players and applied knowledge that I've acquired over years of smartphone filmmaking experience. Every year it seems that the field narrows. LG used to make pretty good video shooting devices, but they actually quit making smartphones over two years ago now. OnePlus used to be one of the front runners, but they now seem to have fallen away in recent years. Xiaomi have since taken up their mission with reasonably priced, well-performing devices. But have they actually made the same mistake as OnePlus by trying to take on the mighty flagships made by Apple and Samsung? The last iPhone I bought was the 14 Pro, and I actually skipped the 13. I've also tested an awful lot of Xiaomi devices, but are they getting any better? The Samsung S23 Ultra turned out to be a great phone for video. But does it beat the iPhone 14 Pro or Pro Max? Sony released a beast of a video shooting smartphone with the Sony Xperia Pro i, but that was back in 2021, so does it still hold up against its rivals? Some reviewers have acclaimed the new Pixel 7 Pro, but is it really that good? And at the end of May, Sony released the Sony Xperia 1V. So there's really three things that I would expect from a flagship device in 2023. You know, especially if that flagship is costing you around about $1,200. Firstly, I would really expect all cameras to be able to shoot in 4K resolution, not just the main camera. And that includes the front selfie camera. The thing is that if one or more of the cameras is limited to 1080p, when you come to edit video from different cameras, you're probably going to notice the difference from shot to shot. Secondly, I would expect all cameras to be able to capture 60 frames per second video. So I use 60 frames per second to shoot slow motion video. This isn't as important as the 4K resolution because you probably don't need slow motion when you're shooting with your front camera. And finally, I really expect that the camera software is going to deliver reliable frame rates and as well be generally glitch free. Smartphones shoot variable rate video, but the reliability is variable depending on the device. Why do reliable frame rates matter? When a camera processor is under stress, it can start to drop frames, and then you end up with less smooth video. Personally, if a flagship phone didn't deliver on these basics, you know, I would be very reluctant to spend over a thousand dollars on it. So let's see which phones are best for shooting video in 2023. For me, the big change for iPhones came with the 12 range, which was one reason the iPhone 12 Pro Max was the first iPhone I ever bought. The iPhone 12 added Dolby Vision as a big innovation. This allowed iPhone users to shoot video with the enhanced dynamic range as well as in 10-bit color. The video looks beautiful, so why isn't the world full of Dolby Vision already? Well, that's because Dolby Vision is a little bit tricky to edit and color grade, and still not everyone can view Dolby Vision because you need a compatible monitor and a compatible platform. But actually, I have started to notice more and more shows streamed in Dolby Vision, so that is definitely the future. As well, you can use Dolby Vision to shoot 10-bit color video, use it for the better grading experience, and then output it in a standard format. So it's still worth having, up until the iPhone 14, iPhones have stuck with the 12 megapixel main sensor and pretty much refused to budge from that. Despite the megapixel inflation taking place in flagship Android devices. But finally, Apple upgraded the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max devices with a 48 megapixel main sensor. The main difference is being able to tap this two times button to crop in without losing quality. Meanwhile, the pixel binning allows better low light performance. The iPhone 13 range brought us the introduction of cinematic mode. And this mode allows us to basically add a blurry background or bokeh effect. I'd say it's still not quite good enough for serious filmmaking, but I now use it all the time for my talking to camera stuff for YouTube. The change to cinematic mode for the iPhone 14 was one of the major reasons I decided to get this device. Whereas in the iPhone 13, the mode was limited in terms of frames per second, resolution, and which camera you could use, in the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max, it's much more versatile. We now have cinematic mode at 24 frames per second. We've got 4K, and there's also 10-bit Dolby Vision HDR. The only thing that's really missing is cinematic mode for the ultra-wide camera. 
But when you're shooting ultra wide, you probably don't want a blurry background anyway. So this has been a real game changer for me for my YouTube videos. The iPhone 14 Pro has a really great selfie camera and you can also use it with the cinematic mode. You just need to be careful to avoid using it in low light situations if you want the best quality. The way it works, the software in the iPhone makes a depth map and then adds blur accordingly. Thing is, other phones are actually catching up here. And as well, you can now apply the cinematic mode effect using the DaVinci Resolve editing software. And actually one of my Patreon members created a quick tutorial to show you how it's done and he kindly allowed me to share it with other members. So if you are a member, you can go ahead and find out how to do that. So you might think that cinematic mode would work better with the main camera, but I actually haven't noticed any difference. So I also tested cinematic mode with an anamorphic adapter and it came out really well. So the difference between the iPhone cinematic mode and the kind of similar cinematic mode or portrait video mode that you're getting in the Android devices is that it's much more flexible when you come to edit. And also you can edit this cinematic mode in Final Cut Pro and iMovie as well. So normally smartphones produce video in a highly compressed codec, either AVC or HEVC. While these codecs are great for producing high quality video in small files, they're not so great if you want to apply color grading. 420 chroma subsampling discards three quarters of the color information. And even if you're shooting in a log format, you can't change that. The addition of ProRes since the iPhone 13 means iPhones can produce video with a professional level codec. I mean, it's still compressed, but the 422 chroma subsampling means only 50% of the color information is now thrown away. And the downside is that ProRes files are really huge compared to H.264 or H.265 files. They're going to fill up your phone quickly and getting files off the iPhone takes a lot longer. But if you don't mind dealing with the extra size, then ProRes is better for grading. It's smoother to edit as well as retaining more detail. And the thing is that if you edit directly on your iPhone, then you don't need to worry about transferring the large ProRes files. Both the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max have exactly the same camera specs. So only go for the Max if you want better battery life and a bigger screen. One thing I do like about the iPhone 14 Pro is all the cameras have similar quality level. Yes, the main camera is definitely better, but the other cameras are not so far off. With most smartphones, you're going to find the secondary cameras are noticeably weaker. Oh, and another benefit of having an iPhone is that the iOS version of third-party software often works better on iPhone than on Android. If you have or you want a gimbal, the app that comes with it is probably going to work better on the iPhone than on Android. Now, so currently to get manual exposure, you're actually going to have to use one of these third-party apps because iPhone does not come with its own inbuilt kind of pro mode, you know, like Androids do. Another issue with iPhones is that you cannot disable the dynamic tone mapping as you can with other devices. So that means that you can never fully lock exposure. Now, one thing that I can predict for certain is that a white balance lock for video is coming to iPhones in the near future. And those with the iOS 17 beta can already do this. When it comes to smartphones, Sony's strategy seems to be quality over quantity. They also produce some of the most expensive devices on the market, but are they really worth it? At the end of May 2023, Sony released the Xperia 1 5 or V. The device comes with a Exmor T for mobile 52 megapixel main sensor, as well as two telephoto cameras. There's a 85 millimeter equivalent and a 125 millimeter equivalent tele with continuous optical zoom. But the 52 megapixel sensor is actually equivalent to a 48 megapixel sensor and takes still photos at a maximum of 12 megapixels. Being a pro camera maker, Sony has given the cameras of this device a more pro color science. And this means your photos don't come out oversaturated or with high contrast. This look is more natural, but of course you can easily add saturation and contrast later if you want to. But maybe this is something that the average consumer doesn't really want to be bothered with, which is why perhaps some reviewers seem to have criticized the device for not matching this kind of zing that you get out of the box from the Samsung or Pixel devices or iPhones. 
Recently, reviewers have criticized the cameras on this device for being too professional and producing too naturalistic colors. For example, the skin tones from this Sony Xperia 1 5 are more accurate than you get from most other devices on the market, especially using the S Cinetone for mobile color profile. It is the easiest to use and it has very natural colors. Another interesting aspect of this device is that it can be used as a monitor when connected to a Sony Alpha camera. And now you can monitor and control your Alpha camera using the phone. And this also allows you to live stream using a Sony Alpha, as well as, for example, shoot vertical video with your DSLR and then share that video directly from the Sony Xperia 1 5 to social media platforms. This is quite an interesting example of how smartphones and other types of cameras are crossing over into the professional world. The Sony Xperia Pro i was released at the end of 2021 and so far there has only been you know, some vague rumors on the next model which will be the Sony Xperia Pro i 2. Some rumors claim the new model is going to have two one inch sensor cameras. So I have no idea how likely this is or when or if this new model is going to be announced, if any of it is true. So like with the Xperia 1 5, the Xperia Pro i can shoot in 4K up to 120 frames per second. And there aren't too many other smartphones, if any, that can shoot such a high frame rate at 4K. The Xperia Pro i comes with a one inch sensor, which is a slightly modified version of the one inside Sony's RX100 7 compact camera. The camera comes with a dual aperture, last implemented by Samsung on their S9, S10 and Note 9 and 10 devices before they abandoned it. A variable aperture was also recently introduced by Xiaomi in their 13 Ultra device, but I'll talk more about that later. So what is so good about a dual aperture? The main advantage is being able to control the amount of light hitting the sensor without pushing the shutter speed too high, which then creates harsher looking video. A dual aperture just gives you a little more room to play with. However, the truth is that not all the one inch sensor gets used because the lens cannot be placed far enough away from the sensor to cover it. So while it's a 20 megapixel sensor, it's only listed as 12 megapixels which is the same as the old iPhone main sensors. However, there is a little bit more clarity and less artifacts than you get in other smartphone shot videos. The detail looks like real detail and not kind of algorithmically AI enhanced, extra sharpened detail. So overall, I'd recommend the Sony devices if you already have some experience with more professional cameras or either that or you want to learn. You're going to get more natural color from photos and videos, as well as a range of different apps for controlling shutter speed, ISO, white balance, and so on. If you do want to learn more about these aspects of filmmaking, I cover all these subjects in my videos for members on Patreon. So talking of sensors with lots of megapixels, the Samsung S23 Ultra main camera is built with a 200 megapixel sensor. When it comes to video, the S23 Ultra can shoot up to 8K resolution at 24 frames per second. But you know, even mid-range Xiaomi's can do that now. Samsung devices have a similar feature to cinematic mode, which is called portrait video mode. This has actually been available for a while and it's actually not too different in terms of quality. The difference is, like I say, iPhone cinematic mode can be edited with iMovie and Final Cut Pro. So this means that you can shoot a video and program a focus ball later. But as I say, you can do this in DaVinci Resolve now with any video clip, including programming the focus balls. The main difference is Apple makes things a little bit easier to use and it's a little bit more versatile. So is it really worth shooting in 8K? Maybe not for everyday use, but the video results from 8K are truly crisp and packed with detail. And if you upload an 8K video to YouTube, even if someone watches it in a lower resolution, it will often look higher quality than a video uploaded in 4K. And of course, using 8K allows you to crop into the video when you're editing. So you can use it for reframing or to zoom in further than you could with a 4K clip. Even when shooting in regular 4K, the quality of the video from the S23 Ultra's main camera is excellent. 
The colors are nice, images are highly detailed as you would expect, and low light performance is good too. Now at first glance, it looks like Samsung has decided to downgrade the selfie camera sensor. For the last two Ultra devices, Samsung put a 40 megapixel sensor in the selfie camera, but for the S23 Ultra, they have reverted to a 12 megapixel camera. Thing is, more pixels doesn't always mean better quality, and that is indeed the case here, as the Samsung S23 Ultra front camera is a visible improvement on previous models. One place where the Samsung S23 Ultra beats the iPhone 14 Pro is in the field of telephoto magnification. The iPhone telephoto is very good quality, and it matches the Samsung, but it can't match the way the Samsung maintains quality at a greater distance. Though personally, I doubt I would need to zoom in that far anyway. But perhaps if you're filming a concert and you're some distance from the stage, it might be useful. Is that a reason to buy the Samsung over the iPhone? I wouldn't say so, but it might sway you towards the Samsung if, if you really couldn't decide between them otherwise. So where iPhones now have Dolby Vision, Samsung devices can shoot video in the competing HDR system, which is HDR10+. So bear in mind there's actually HDR10 and HDR10+, and these codecs carry metadata, which tells compatible monitors how best to display the video. And it adds brightness and it adds dynamic range. But HDR10+, adjusts the image frame by frame, as Dolby Vision does. So put simply, this again allows you to shoot video with 10-bit color, which is great for color grading, just like with Dolby Vision. For a while now, Samsung devices have come with a pro video mode, which allows manual control. So you can set your shutter speed, ISO, focus, white balance, and all that kind of stuff. And as well, using this mode, you can switch off the dynamic tone mapping. So you can actually lock exposure solidly and it will be completely locked, unlike with the iPhone. Overall, the Samsung S23 Ultra it's a great all-round smartphone for shooting video. And really, the main standout advantage it has over the iPhone is the range of the telephoto with its better image clarity at the maximum magnification levels. So the Pixel 7 Pro is Google's latest flagship smartphone. But as it's priced at several hundred dollars less than most of its rivals, I think we can lower our expectations a little bit. So this device comes with a 50 megapixel main camera and a 48 megapixel telephoto and as well a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera. So the good news is that they can all shoot up to 4K at 60 frames per second. 120 and 240 frames per second can be achieved at 1080p. Now overall, the Pixel 7 Pro performs pretty well considering it's the most affordable of all the main flagships. And the device also comes with its own version of cinematic mode, called cinematic video mode. The Pixel cinematic mode does a pretty good job. Again, it doesn't have the nice editing features of the iPhone. And as well, frame rates do become a little bit unreliable once this extra demand is added to the processor. While the Pixel Pro's telephoto does a great job for the price, it doesn't quite match the Samsung 23 Ultra's telly when it comes to maintaining image quality when fully zoomed in, but it's pretty close. And those 200 megapixels compared to 50 megapixels does make a little bit of a difference here. Currently, the Pixel 7 Pro does not provide manual camera controls. So like with the iPhone, you're gonna need a third-party app. However, the Pixel 7 does at least support 10-bit HDR video. Ultimately, the Pixel Pro is probably the best video shooter for this kind of money, or at least at the time of making this video but it doesn't quite match on every level the top iPhone and Samsung devices. The Xiaomi 13 Pro comes with lenses by Leica, wrapped up in this camera block with these futuristic looking rounded edges. The Xiaomi 13 Pro main camera has a Sony IMX 989 one inch type sensor with 50.3 megapixels. So this is a sensor Sony and Xiaomi developed in collaboration and is the same as the one in the Xiaomi 12S Ultra. It's a 23 mm equivalent with a f1.9 aperture and stabilization comes in the form of Xiaomi's Hyper OIS. In both Pro and regular video mode, the 13 Pro can shoot 8K at 24 frames per second. 
With 4K or lower resolution, there's 24, 30, and 60 frames per second available. However, when we switch to the 32 megapixel selfie camera, we get a rather disappointing 1080p at 30 frames per second maximum. Now we're talking about a device powered by the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor. So I really don't understand why they've limited the resolution. Whereas most devices that support 10-bit HDR, go either with HDR10 Plus or Dolby Vision, the Xiaomi Pro can actually shoot both. You've got HDR10 Plus, 10-bit Dolby Vision HDR, as well as 10-bit log. So that gives you some nice color grading options. The stabilization is really effective in the Xiaomi 13 Pro, but considering how much of the frame it crops to achieve it, you would expect it to be good. So if you do like shooting highly detailed close-ups, the macro camera on the 13 Pro supports 4K at 60 frames per second. The Xiaomi 13 Pro is a very good phone, but it's also about the same price as the iPhone 14 Pro or the Samsung 23 Ultra, so we should expect an equal performance, such as 4K video from the selfie camera. But actually, the 13 Pro isn't Xiaomi's only flagship this year. There's also the 13 Ultra. The price for the Xiaomi 13 Ultra seems to vary, but on the Spanish version of the Xiaomi website, it's listed for a tasty 1500 euros, while other sites list the phone for around 11 to 1200 dollars, so similar to the Samsung and iPhone flagships. Again, Xiaomi has partnered with Leica to produce the imaging system, but have Xiaomi finally given us the 4K front camera that we need from a phone costing somewhere over a thousand dollars? No, because it's still locked in at 1080p. And again, it's coming from a 32 megapixel front camera, so it just doesn't make sense. The Xiaomi 13 Ultra main camera has the same one inch type Sony sensor as the Xiaomi 13 Pro, but the Ultra has four rear 50 megapixel cameras, and the main camera can actually alternate between f1.9 and f4.0 aperture. So that makes it one of the rare smartphones with an adjustable aperture. So the f1.9 setting should allow you more bokeh, while the f4.0 setting is going to allow you to have slower shutter speeds in bright conditions. So you'll be swapping blurry backgrounds for blurry motion. So there's a 120mm telephoto camera, a 75mm telephoto camera, and a 12mm ultra wide. So when it comes to shooting video, the 13 Ultra can shoot up to 8K, like many other Xiaomi's and Androids. But to my eyes, the video from the main camera does look very good quality. And like with the Sony phones, there's a similar natural looking color profile. Again, the 13 Ultra can shoot 10-bit HDR Dolby Vision. So overall, I'd say it's pretty close to the other flagships but does not beat them. In fact, in my opinion, this device still falls a little bit short of the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max and the Samsung S23 Ultra. The Poco brand is a range of devices also made by Xiaomi. So I had the opportunity to test out the F5 Pro recently and I was pretty impressed. Yes, it is still only a 1080p selfie video, but the phone is at least half the price of the Ultra. And on that kind of a budget, you're going to struggle to find a device with such a good main camera. As we expect now, it can produce 8K video at 24 frames per second, and also 4K up to 60 frames per second, all produced by a 64 megapixel camera with a pretty big f1.8 aperture. And that big aperture helps in low light conditions and adds some nice shallow depth of field as well. So if your budget is around the $500 mark, you're not going to go too far wrong with the Poco F5 Pro. Like most other Android devices, the F5 Pro comes with a Pro mode, which gives you the complete manual exposure, focus, and white balance control. Another good thing about Pro mode in all these devices is that it removes the annoying flickers you often get when using the regular video mode, and that includes the iPhone. And this is down to the computational processes, like I said before, the dynamic tone mapping, which does give your smartphone camera a greater dynamic range but at the expense of these little glitches that you get sometimes. And as well that you can't completely lock exposure. When you're shooting photos, it's fine, but for video, it does cause problems. Anyway, if you switch to pro mode and use the manual control, the dynamic tone mapping is gonna be switched off. 
So I do recommend that you use this in conditions where the light isn't too bright or too harsh. If you've got a nice gentle light, then you don't really need that dynamic tone mapping. So another more reasonably priced option is the OnePlus 11. This year, OnePlus has released the OnePlus 11, but unlike previous years, there will be no pro version this time. Instead, OnePlus has kind of decided to go back to what was really their original mission, which was to produce an affordable smartphone capable of shooting decent photos and videos. OnePlus is actually now in the third year of its partnership with leading camera company Hasselblad, who are rather more famous for their photography cameras than their video cameras. I mean, I don't know, do these camera brand partnerships really mean anything? Anyway, Hasselblad's input is said to be focused more around the camera's color profile, and they just let OnePlus do get on with the hardware stuff. Like with the Xiaomi 13 Pro, the OnePlus 11 comes with a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset, which is currently the kind of standard, pretty powerful image processor. But yet again, the selfie camera is limited to 1080p and a maximum of 30 frames per second. So like with the Poco F5 Pro, the main camera has a big f1.8 aperture combined with a 50 megapixel sensor. Again, we have the option of 8K, 24 frames per second. Now, usually with these phones that support 8K video, shooting in 8K is the only option if you want to shoot at 24 frames per second. Well, not with the Samsungs. With the Samsungs, you can choose 4K and 24 frames per second. But with these Xiaomi and OnePlus and Poco phones, you're gonna get this situation where you can only shoot 24 frames per second in 8K. But it takes a bit of time, but you can actually compress your 8K video down to 4K in the native photo gallery app. It's pretty simple to do, but it's, you know, it does take a couple of minutes. Another thing to bear in mind with 8K video is that it does put extra pressure on your camera processor. And remember, pressure on the processor can lead to those dropped frames, which then leads to less smooth video. So this might be a reason why your 8K video is looking a bit juddery, even when you compress it down to 4K. I would say that the Samsung devices perform better in this respect than the Xiaomi's and the OnePlus and the Pixels as well. Now, if you were to compare this device to a flagship Xiaomi, there's not too much difference in video quality. You have one pretty strong main camera and then a series of rather poorer performing secondary cameras. And so then if you try to edit your ultra wide or your telephoto footage with your main camera footage, you're probably gonna notice this change in quality. And as well, the difference becomes more noticeable when you zoom from the ultra wide to the wide to the telly in one take. So with phones like the iPhone 14 Pro and the Samsung S23 Ultra, all the cameras are strong. So you can then cut between the footage from all the cameras and there will only be slight differences. And the same goes for the Sony devices. And meanwhile, the top Xiaomi's 13 Pro and Ultra are kind of somewhere between these mid-range devices and their main flagships. So which one is actually the best? I think it uh, depends what you're looking for. For the sort of regular flagship devices, we're still choosing, in my opinion, between the iPhone and the Samsung. The good thing about the iPhone is that, you know, if you get the Pro, which I have, rather than the Max, you still get all the same level of quality of cameras, all the same specs, but in a smaller device. But with the Samsung, to get the top level of quality and all the features, you will have to get the bigger device, which is the Ultra. If you want to go for a more pro option, then the Sony is the one. Definitely aimed more at the professional filmmaker, someone who really wants to dedicate themselves to filmmaking, or maybe wants to integrate it with their Sony camera system already. So if you're looking for a more budget level device, I would recommend the Xiaomi F5 Pro. So to help you cut through all this jargon and hype, I've created a buyer's guide. So the next time you're buying a smartphone and your priority is to get great looking video and it will help you get the best device possible on your specific budget. And this guide is available for members on Patreon along with all the other stuff. There's my nine day course. It will take you from beginner to more advanced, planned out step by step, not too much technical stuff, just a good balance between the creative side and the technical side, just enough to get your videos looking much more professional and hopefully turning your work into cinematic masterpieces. We've also got the Discord 
Discord server. So you can chat there with me and other smartphone filmmakers. And we can share ideas. I can give you little tips along the way to your journey to becoming a better smartphone filmmaker. So that's it for me in this video. And I'll see you in the next video that I see you in.